now I'm going to English. <laughs> uh, so um, I would like first to thank uh, Cedre and uh, uh, Luik for the kind of invitation to be here with you today. Uh, to try and show you the work that the Ospark Commission uh, is being uh, is been doing uh, during the last years, but mostly to learn from you. And uh, as I want to, um, uh, as I will try to explain uh, the importance of your work in order for us to do our work. So, um, well, Francois has explained a lot better than me the the sources of marine litter and its uh, wide spectrum of impacts, the environmental, the economic, uh, the impacts on safety and human health, and also the cultural impact of uh, marine litter, the very slow rates of degradation, and the continuously growing quantities of litter and debris that are disposed at, uh, at the sea. And, uh, well, we are still uh, finding a gradual increase in marine litter on sea and at shore. So, um, but not everything is bad news. Concerns are increasing. Um, we are tackling the deficiencies in the implementation of reg regulations. Uh, we are trying to improve the enforcement of the existing international, regional, and national regulations and standards. And we are tackling the lack of awareness among the main stakeholders and the general public. That was, uh, well, right now, we may think that there's no lack of awareness, but this is a continuous uh, uh, work. So the, the OSPA Commission uh, tends to, to, to do its work with an integrated approach, uh, with the involvement of all stakeholders. So this is something that must be done on, the, on an international level down to the local level. And we do believe that individual behavior and consumption choices can make a difference in many of the problems that we are facing right now. So the OSPAR convention itself, I think it is the, um, the outcome of an, increased, um, of an increased concerns about marine litter pollution. So it all started, let's say like this, with the Bonn Agreement, which was um, the result of a big oil spill. And um, it, it was uh, implemented for, well, not only, but mainly for maritime disasters and chronic ship pollution. Then we had another convention for dumping harmful substances. And then in 1974, the Paris Convention uh, introduced the land-based sources of marine litter. So the, the OSPAR Convention was signed in 1992. And it's, it, is the, it is the result of the two previous conventions, the Oslo and, well, the Oslo and Paris Convention, that's why the name OSPAR does not stand for anything. It's just the, the combination of Oslo and Paris. So not uh, that, um, not a good choice, I guess. <laughs> so the OSPAR is the mechanism by which 15 governments uh, and the Uni European Union cooperate to protect the marine environment of the Northeast Atlantic. So France is one of the 15 countries, one of the 15 contracting parties of this convention. And uh, the convention also has 62 observer organizations that play an essential role in, the, in this convention. They do not only take part in the meetings, but they uh, contribute actively to the work and contribute actively to the shaping of policy development and implementation, not only on OSPAR area, but throughout the world. So the OSPAR convention area is a very huge area of the Northeast, Northeast Atlantic. It is divided in five major areas, the Arctic, the North Sea, the Celtic Sea, which is much lower than I thought it would be, uh, the Iberian Coast and Bay of Biscay, and the wider Atlantic, which is not only sea, but it has some small Portuguese islands just around here. Uh, so this convention has five major objectives to prevent and eliminate pollution protect the marine area from the adverse effects of human activities, safeguarding human health, conservation of marine ecosystem, and whenever possible, to recovery the marine areas that were affected. So the, well, this is not working properly, but 
This here are the guiding principles of the convention, the ecosystem approach, precautionary principle, polluter pace principle, and the use of best available techniques and best environmental practices. Yeah, the guiding principles. Okay, so on the, on the international level, the OSPAR is been doing, the, uh, well, it's been conducting international cooperation with all other regional sea conventions that are already established throughout the world. So we tend to work, sorry, we tend to work with the, closely with the, the other conventions for the um, Atlantic area. So the Helsinki Convention for the Baltic Sea, the Barcelona Convention for the Mediterranean, and the Cartagena Convention for the wider Caribbean. But we also work with all other regional sink conventions on the scope of the UNEP towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, and most specifically the SDG 14, Life Below Water, but not only that one. So I told you about the integrated approach that OSPAR is trying to follow. So we, the most of our work is outreaching and integrating a lot of different stakeholders and initiatives in order to combat and further institutionalize this marine litter issue on the public opinion. So our role can be a coordination role, just information exchange, uh, data provision, assignment of memorandums of understanding, but uh, we can all also just support the external initiatives. Within our organization, our work is divided in five major work areas. So biodiversity, radioactive substances, uh, offshore industry, hazardous substances and eutrophication, and finally, environmental impacts of human activities where the marine litter is uh, uh, integrated. So this is a diagram, a very huge diagram and mostly unreadable diagram of what OSPAR is organized, how our OSPAR is organized, but these five committees here are a committee for each of the working areas of OSPAR. And these committees provide support to the political, let's call it like this, the political aspect of OSPAR convention work. So the commission where everything is decided bases its work on the work of the five committees. And then the five committees are supported themselves by um, the, what we call the intersessional correspondence group. These are uh, expert groups, technical groups, uh, where um, our work is debated and, and discussed to provide support to the, to the committees. So the, the, the committees is, uh, provide uh, the linkage between the technical work and the political area, so the decision making. And we tend to, to base our works in three different uh, areas. So monitoring, regular scientific assessment, and decision making. And we try to make a virtuous circle uh, of continuous improvement uh, because decision making must be supported on regular scientific <coughs> assessments, which themselves are based on monitoring. So after the decision making, we need to monitor to, to assess and to, to decide whether we should improve or not the decision making of the decision, uh, the decision process. And I, I tend to believe that this is really working. So I will give you an overview of the three different aspects. Starting with the, with the assessment, OSPAR was signed in 1992. The first assessment, the quality status report, was done in the year 2000. The second one in the year 2010. And the third one is predicted for 2023. So in the meantime, we've made the intermediate assessment of 2017. This is something you can consult online. But the intermediate assessment, um, bear this in mind, w uh, was based on results from the monitoring until 2013, 2014, or 2015. So I will explain this a little better afterwards. So the 2017 intermediate assessment is not only about marine litter. It's uh, about pressures from human activities, but we also have uh, uh, some, uh, some assessed items on biodiversity or socioeconomics or um, climate and ocean acidification. So it's a huge assessment. And even within the human activities, uh, the pressure from human activities, marine litter is just a fraction. We have, we have others like uh, underwater noise or non-indigenous species. And all of this is based on the technical works that are ongoing throughout the OSPAR area. So getting back to the huge diagram, as you can see, the uh, Environmental Impacts of Human Activities Committee is right here. 
And then the, special, the specialist group on marine litter is just this one here. So as you can see, it's a tiny fraction of all OSPAR work. So this intersessional correspondence group on marine litter is the first line of OSPAR action towards marine litter. And uh, it gathers around two, two times a year. And this is the perfect example of that integrated approach I've told you about. Because we don't only have the country's administrations there at these meetings. We, are, we also have the specialists, the, the research institutes, the universities, the NGOs, the industry, and others. Uh, and this is why I think that um, our work is being well done, because we can gather around all the people that has the knowledge. Uh, and this is where the discussion and blending of ideas, problems, work streams really start. Uh, on, on this level of the ICG. So this is where the indicators and monitoring schemes are discussed, are uh, debated, are, are evaluated, where the, the background documents or assessments are produced, and uh, where the stakeholder dialogue processes that we implement are decided. And so this is clearly the basis for the decisions, recommendations and measures that the OSPA Commission on the top level will approve afterwards. So this is all based on the monitoring. I'm not going to, to, to bore you with the monitoring details because the monitoring details is not boring. It's, it will be uh, because afterwards they will be uh, really better explained by the people who are conducting the monitoring programs. So I would make them boring uh, because I wouldn't be able to explain them. So just a quick overview uh, on the intermediate assessment of 2017 three different indicators were assessed uh, regarding marine litter. Uh, Francois already uh, gave you an idea of that. So it's beach litter, it's uh, seafloor sea litter, and plastic particles and fulmar stomachs. So just a quick overview on the results of the intermediate assessment in 2017. So this is the map of the results from that assessment. The period assessed was 2014-2015, and the dots here uh, is the average number of litter items per 100 meters uh, transect of beach litter monitoring. So as you can see, there are some areas that still have 10,000 litter items per 100 meter transect. So this is a lot. And we, when we try to divide this material, this marine litter by composition, we can see that uh, on all five areas, Plastic and polystyrene uh, is almost 90% of total of marine litter items that we found on our, uh, on our coast. So the conclusions of the assessment is that litter pollution is still common on the coastlines of the Northeast Atlantic. Plastic fragments, uh, packaging, nets and ropes are the most frequent items and we all know how harmful this could be to biodiversity. And this is not only a problem for the marine environment itself, it's a, it has socioeconomic costs and harms, the loss of revenue and the costs of beach litter cleaning. Beach litter cleaning. Uh, so the commitment that OSPA took when we started to substan substantially reduce marine litter in this area is still uh, not yet achieved. So this is a continuous uh, work. Regarding the seafloor, this is the most recent indicator that has been assessed. So uh, we all know that we know that uh, sea floor litter is influenced by anthropogenic inputs, rivers, winds, and currents, and this is a transboundary problem. So we need to work together on this one, uh, uh, and it it also is a severe threat to biodiversity, not only the entanglement or um, ghost fishing, uh, but also others like uh, vectors for non-indigenous species to establish. This methodology is based on data from the trawling fleet. And uh, we need more service stations and longer data sets in order to improve this, uh, this assessment. So in 2023, we, we, we expect to have better results. But we already knew that litter on the seafloor was really widespread. Well, again, plastic is the predominant material. And uh, floating and sinking litter follow different pathways, gathering different hotspots, and do, do not necessarily overlap. So the problems must be, must be tackled uh, with specific measures and approaches. So this is not something that we can do um, without tackling specific problems. 
Last one is plastic particles in Fulmar stomachs. Fulmar is a pelagic seabird. Uh, it only comes to land to breed, and it feeds exclusively, sorry, exclusively at sea. So the, the plastic that we find on the uh, Fulmar stomach is, reflects the presence of plastic in the bird's environment. So this is a, an indicator for floating litter. The monitoring methods are uh, just analyzing the stomach content but on dead beached birds, so no harm is done to any bird. And the long-term objective was to, uh, well, we were expecting to reach a level where less than 10% of all birds analyzed had less than 0 0.1 grams of plastic ingested. This graph here shows the percentage of plastic ingested, and this is the long-term target. 10% of the population. These here are the colonies, the breeding colonies that are being monitored. And as, as you can see, we are not even near the long-term target regarding this, uh, this um, indicator. So 93% of the birds that were uh, analyzed during this period had ingested plastic, and 60% of it exceeded the 0 0.1 gram limit. So, as I told you, this reflects the presence of plastic in the bird's environment. And, moreover, the Fulma populations are currently in decline. So, plastic may not be um, a lethal uh, thing to, to the birds, but sure, it, has potential, it poses potential threats to, to the colonies. So, the long-term goal is still distant. So, what have we done with this? Now, we need to, to speak about the decision-making. So, Ospar has implemented or has approved its Marine Litter Regional Action Plan, um, which is uh, a plan that was set in 2014. As I told you, the intermediate assessment had results from 2013, 14, 15. So we can say that the Marine Litter Regional Action Plan was set right after or during the intermediate assessment. So the results of the intermediate assessment does not reflect the work that is being done within the regional action plan. So this plan is divided in four sections, and it has 55 actions. Uh, some of them are common actions, actions that must be implemented throughout the OSPAR area and are mandatory. We have actions to engage with other competent bodies when they will do better than us, and also actions that must be implemented by the contracting parties in their own countries, the so-called national actions. Yeah, okay, so the, the plan has four different uh, sectors, sea-based, uh, sea, um, not sea-based, no. Yeah, sea-based sources, land-based sources, education and outreach, and uh, what is the other one, and recover. So the plan is divided, this is clearly not working, but, uh, well, we tackle a lot of different uh, things. Uh, uh, this supposedly would have, uh, on this part, the, the measures for sea-based sources and on the other end, the land-based sources. But you can see there are a lot of different things as port reception facilities, fishing for litter, or abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. These are all measures that the regional action plan has. And this is something that you can also... Um, uh, see online, so the plan is available for anyone to, to consult. And I will give you just two examples of actions that are being conducted on this plan. One is fishing for litter. So this is the Action 43 of the Regional Action Plan. It was approved, it had a measure approved in 2013, and it's designed to, to make everyone actively engage with ports, harbors, and vessels in order for the vessels that use uh, mostly the ones that use bottom uh, contact gear, fishing gear, uh, to lend their non-operational waste. And so the contracting parties need to aggregate the, the data and to report annually to WASPAR. So this is the, the graphic from 2013 to 2017, the data. So more and more countries have been reporting, so they are engaging on their own countries. More and more harbors are being involved and more and more vessels are joining the program. So we can say that just for 2017, more than 700 tons of litter was removed from the marine environment just because of this measure. So 
uh, this is clearly working, but we need to improve it and to, um, to make it more uh, broadly distributed. Regarding microplastics, one of the items that is land-based uh, source, we have three different actions for uh, tackle microplastic problem. Uh, this is being done since 2014. And the first thing was an evidence-based, an assessment of the land-based inputs of microplastics to the marine environment. A background document was produced on pre-production pre pre pellets by France. Um, and uh, we have uh, already established dialogue, or concluded a dialogue with Cosmetics Europe and Plastic Europe, and a call on the European Union to ban microplastic in cosmetics. So this has already been done. And we already, of course, we assisted the development of the European Union plastic strategy for a circular economy. What is ongoing? So there's an ongoing stakeholder dialogue with the pellet, in the plastic production chain toward the problem of pellets. This was something that occurred yesterday, right here in Paris. Uh, so this is ongoing, and we will keep on following up the European approach to tackle through chemical regulation, the REACH. So this uh, action plan uh, needs to be evaluated from time to time. So right now, there's an evaluation of progress going on towards the Northeast Atlantic environmental strategy and the setting of a new strategy for 2020 to 2030. So on this evaluation of progress, I've told you that the, the regional action plans has two major actions, the ones that should be implemented by uh, the countries on their national level, the national actions. And I can tell you that most of the contracting parties have already the vast majority of their national actions ongoing or fully implemented. Regarding, regarding the other ones, the common actions, this is something that must be agreed by the 15 contracting parties, so it takes longer. But nearly half of these common actions are already ongoing or fully implemented. So I cannot give you any details of this evaluation properly, but they will be available uh, soon enough for you to, to understand that this is happening and it's having very good results. But the regional action plan is to be implemented until 2021. Then it will be reviewed and updated, not terminated. So this is an ongoing process. And uh, I am confident that the results from the quality status report in 2023, which will be based on results from 2020 or 2021 at most, will uh, show re the results of the implementation of the regional action plan. So I will end up by stealing uh, the slogan of the recently signed UK Plastics Pact, because I, I do believe in this. So they come with a slogan, with, which is together we can. And they say the we are the brands, the retailers, manufacturers, producers, recyclers, NGOs, governments, and local authorities. And I will add the regional sea conventions the international organizations, the researchers, and the citizens. Because I really think that all together we can, and I believe that we will. So thank you very much for your attention.